I mean, if, if, you, if you go, and I'm not trying to be a jerk here, but if you go and you hang out with people that are, that are really down and out, really immersed in sin, it's hard, isn't it? Because they're just like us, and the more immersed in sin that we get, what do we get like? The more introspective, right? The more selfish. It's hard to be around people who have given themselves to sin because they're, they're consumed with themselves. And I'm not, it's us too. There go I, but by the grace of God, I'm not making some statement like, there's people. I'm just saying that that's who Jesus wouldn't hung out with. And he said crazy things like, go and sin no more. I forgive you, right? He did crazy things like, just say, hey, your sins are forgiven because you trusted me. And this is who Jesus is. So when we focus on, we consider who the real Jesus is from his word, from his word, <laughs> then it's incredible the faith that that builds, doesn't it? Because if you know that God is for you, I, I don't know if you have this existence. I'm a closet legalist. I'm recovering. Been, a, <laughs> been free. Been, you know, I really am. Because I got saved into a church that was like, if you don't, well, let's put it this way. Every male was expected, you spent at least about 20 hours a week in the word, period. Or you were shamed. You, we went to, we had Tuesday night prayer meeting, Wednesday Bible study, Thursday night two by two outreach, Saturday uh, in the morning we listened to, to uh, tape sermons for two hours, Sunday started about 8.30 and it went to about 5.30 at night, and then oftentimes we had other stuff after that, and that included an hour break to go two by two witnessing in our downtown every week. And we had 40 hour week jobs, and we were expected to study the word. And there were some good things, I mean, good things that came from that, too. A lot of people got outreach, too, and so forth. But it destroyed a lot of us. It destroyed a lot of people. And it, and it either caused people to shipwreck their faith or they become incredibly proud uh, because of what they had accomplished. But the point is this. When, when we hear about the wrong Jesus, when we buy into the works-based Jesus, when we buy into the I get my own righteousness, Jesus. The, the fallout is catastrophic for us and for everyone around us. But when we're looking at and considering and studying the true Jesus, it develops faith. When you know that Jesus is for you and not against you, when you understand the power of the cross, that sin was forever paid for by Christ, that you are forgiven of sin, then in 1 John, where it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that when you look at that in the context, because John says right there, he says, we're telling you these things because we want you to have fellowship with us and fellowship with the Father. When you begin to understand that John is not saying that you have to be re-forgiven of your sin, that it's a, it's a fellowship issue and not a salvation issue. When you understand the, the present active indicative, which is all over the scripture about how salvation works and that might sound weird, but the idea that every time salvation is talked about and righteousness, it's always presented in a Greek verb form that is you being acted upon at the present time. Does that make sense? So in forgiveness is you being acted upon by God, by an outside force, for your forgiveness. Your righteousness is established. You are as right with God as you will ever be in your entire life. You are not building up righteousness to get more right with God. Now, see, if you're like me and you're a closet legalist, you go, no, that can't be. The people will go crazy. But is that really your response? When you know the love of Christ in your life, when you know the forgiveness and the cleansing, is your response like, hey, everybody, let's go to LBT tonight and get liquored? Or is your response like, I want to be closer to Jesus. Who is this forgiver? Who is this Lord? Now, sin has a penalty, right? If I, like, if I act like a complete jerk, if I go in there right now and, and we're, we get done and we pray, like, oh, God, you're so good, and I thank you, and, 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 and then I go in there and be like, out of my way, I'm first in line, <laughs> right? That'll produce a fruit, won't it? Some people in here will go, I'm never going to that church again because it's full of hypocrites. Some people will be like, what is that guy's problem? And hopefully some of you will be like, what's wrong with James? We should go ask him what's wrong. That was weird. 
right? So sin will have destruction. If I am continually rude to my wife, guess what my family life will be like? Really bad, right? If she stays with me. If I, if I dominate my children, I treat them poorly, guess what their lives will be like? Guess what my relationship will be like with them after they're 18, right? Sin will always destroy. It always will. So we're not saying, oh, sin's not a big deal. It's a huge deal, but it's not a forgiveness deal anymore because of Christ. It's not a righteousness issue. It's a fellowship issue. We don't sin against the law anymore. The law doesn't apply to us anymore, Romans 7 tells us. We sin against love. So it's a new relationship that we have in Christ. When we hear about that Jesus, it begins to build faith. And it's kind of an interesting dynamic because once that starts to happen, we, we, we kind of have, if you will, and, and this is crude, so forgive me, but like tier one faith, right? We got saved. We're like, I'm, Jesus is legit. I'm not sure how legit yet, but I'm, I'm thankful that I'm saved, and, and I know that something's changed in my life. And then hopefully we get in fellowship, we start discipleship. What's discipleship? It's just meeting with someone, typically, learning how to walk with Jesus, learning truth about things, someone to help you, to pray with you. That's discipleship. It's not indoctrination. You know, if you're interested in being discipled, we have people that would love to help you with that. But it's not that we're going to indoctrinate you into our church. You don't have to come here. It's so that you can learn about who Jesus is, right? That's it. So all of a sudden, you're in this dynamic. You got saved. You've learned a little bit about Jesus. Hopefully, you're learning more. And then what happens is what Paul's talking about. Trial happens. Difficulty. And it can be any kind of difficulty. It can be somebody caused it, you caused it, something else like we already talked about. Just random happened. And then we have to decide in that very moment, will we believe? That's what we have to decide. Because if, if struggle enters my life and I walk through it with disbelief, what will that look like? Anger? Anxiety? Depression, right? Lashing out, stress. Those things can lead to cardiac issues, all sorts of things, right? Mental health issues. Because if I reject suffering in my life, if I reject Jesus' power in it, then all I have left is me. That's it. And then the, the, the consoling friends of the internet and my Facebook. And then I can just rage and say how everybody sucks. And my real friends will say, you're right. Everybody does suck. Right? Because that's how support works in our era now. I complain and you validate it. And if you don't validate it, you're clearly my enemy. It's so weird. But whatever. What about a faithful friend who comes along and says, you're acting crazy? Where are those people? Anyway. So if I, if I respond in a, in a negative way, that's what I'd look forward to. Right? That's what we've been talking about. But in this dynamic, I can reach back to my past experience and the truth of what's been shown me, and I can go, but God, right? He works all things together for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. That he is so incredible and so powerful that any negative event in my life, whether I caused it, someone else caused it, or the universe caused it, I'm using that generically, I'm not saying something weird, please don't email me, you know, whatever happened, that I can then say, okay, I can be perplexed but not destroyed, right? I can be pressured, but not crushed. Because I go, I don't like this. I wish it were different, but it's not. So Lord, what do you have for me in this? What is it that you would like to achieve in my life? And it's crazy because he comes through every single time. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it, I think in his, his patience, it allows us to languish like little children who finally just get gassed out after a tantrum, right? We've all seen it, hopefully not an adult, but we've all seen it, right? Where a kid just, just finally just burns out of their tantrum and they're just like, lay there like, ah, oh, and they're all red and sweaty, right? And you're like, and now comes punishment. We've worked through this, right? But so but we've seen it. And sometimes that's what we do. We have to work through our tantrum. And we're finally, we're, we hit the floor and we're red and we're sweaty and we're just like, why, Lord? Okay, whatever. I, I got nothing left. I got nothing left. And all of a sudden, God says, all right, I'm going to work. Now that you're done, <laughs> right? Now that you're done, 
I can work. Because a big part of our life, how many times, and in, in like in, for example, in Romans 6, do we read yield? Yield, yield, yield. Yielding is letting someone else go, right? In traffic and whatnot. We're told to yield to Christ. We're told to yield to the Holy Spirit. We're told to yield, 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 which means stop you, stop me, and let God, right?